So, vielen Dank, Ingo. So, thank you very much, Ingo. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to our afternoon meeting uh, on digital attackers and what the business model is. Uh, I can see somebody who doesn't want to be a digital attacker, that's my colleague, but we wanted to be provocative. We wanted to get everybody a, everybody's attention. So, we're going to spend the next uh, time to give you some uh, input on that, first a presentation, then a dialogue, in order to bring home to you what sort of consequences there's going to be in, in all of that for you. The only housekeeping rule is our slides are in English, we speak German, and um, if you have any questions or comments on what we're saying, please ask in whichever language you feel comfortable in, as long as it's German or English, you'll get an answer. And we have simultaneous interpreters at the back who can uh, do English, German, German, English, any which way you want. So. At the beginning, we've got, um, uh, as I say, a brief presentation. Altogether, we've only got about 40 minutes, which is not much time for the three of us. Engelberg is at the front, uh, but we are digital attackers, so we are going to be on very familiar terms. So just say Engelberg to him. Dr. Engelberg Wimmer on my left-hand side, um, CEO of um, EAD Co. AG, also author of several books. He's got various projects dealing with uh, automotive, the automotive industry, mobility, digital business mob models, and all they will come together. So you could ask yourself, what's this guy going to tell us today? From the car industry? But automotive, automobile mobility, well, the two won't probably merge completely, but the two of us had the great pleasure to um, run a pretty innovative um, project with one of the big DAX companies, and Engelberg will tell you how much of it stuck with him. On my right-hand side is Christopher, the digital attacker. We'll let him have his say later. Uh, we're going to tease each other a bit. At the beginning, what we called it was anti-porters, as in Hannibal, but uh, after 10 years' time, he's definitely arrived in the middle mobility business travel. Well. If it's true, we'll find out. So, I'm sorry that I can't give you another warm-up. Engelberg comes from Austria, our neighboring country, and all our ski-loving colleagues will know that the Austrians always love to tell you um, a funny story at the beginning. So, I don't know whether he will, but let's let him start. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much for this uh, introduction and for the explanation. I hope that wasn't uh, an excuse that I happen to be Austrian. I would like to try to tell you a few stories now, because our experience tells us that at the end of the day, stories stick in people's mind much better than slides. And after all, we don't want to give you a lecture here. We want to tell a story. The first thing I suggest we do is when we talk about digital attackers, the things we are going to discuss today, um, actually what we're talking about is the day after tomorrow, because the things we have to do tomorrow, we've just heard about those in the previous session. But what we are dealing with now is to prepare the world to the day after tomorrow and how to shape that time. Day after tomorrow is a hell of a lot less far removed than you all think. Bill Gates once said, if you plan for one year, we overestimate what we can do. And if you plan for 10 years, we underestimate what we can do. Digitization, that's the big motto of our presentation. And first of all, what I suggest we do is we just cancel the word digitization completely. The reason is then nobody knows what's, what's in our head then, and everybody is drunk as skunks, and then they all feel terribly hungover. So if you talk about digitization, we can talk about three things. The demand side, in other words, what is it that people actually want uh, in the field of mobility and travel solutions? And then there is the supply side, what's on offer? And then what changes? That's the technology angle. Let's tell you the demand side in a sort of intellectual experiment, which I think brings it home. Digitization means that we are going through a phase shift in that book, which um, was mentioned, I call that the digital experience economy. So I'd ask you, please close your eyes and imagine this is the year 1900, and you're just 10 years old, and it happens to be your birthday. Your mum is going to bake you a cake. How will she do that in the year 1900? 
she will get the corn from the field, which is stored in the barn, gets, uh, bakes a cake. Maybe she buys in a few things that she doesn't produce herself, subsistence farming. Now, 25 years later, same situation, but one generation on. The family has moved from the countryside into the city. There is no field, no chickens, so you have to buy not just for one cent's worth, but 10 cents worth. 25 years ago, later than that, another situation. You don't even have your own chickens. You've got to buy in worth a euro or a dollar. 25 years after that, you actually go and buy the cake. And then you do the party and you spend $10. And 25 years after that, again, same situation. You go to Frost, the clown, McDonald's, uh, have their birthday party and spend $100. And now, in the digital age, you're spending $1,000 because you've got an event that you stream live because the grandparents happen to be on holiday in Singapore. They have got their virtual glasses on. Kids are partying here. The, the mother is um, switching herself into it from some uni in Toronto. It's going to be a streamed event, and the character will have changed totally. Every time, the way in which the event is put together has changed dramatically. And my question to you, as far as both the supply and demand sides are concerned, you as a provider in your sector, will you be the one who provides the eggs for the cake? Or will you be the ones who creatively shape the event? That's the question we should ask ourselves. And that's what the digital attackers question. There are a few things that I would like to have you take home with you as, as, as stories that we tell you. First of all, B2B customers mature and demanding. What does that mean? It means that in the travel industry, we find people who don't have a secretary as they used to, or they uh, shout to as they leave their office, oh, book me a business trip from Stuttgart to Dusseldorf and back next week. Digitization has meant that our working tools have become condensed, and that poor guy no longer has to do all his travel bookings himself, but there is a lot more frequency, there is higher complexity, and there is a great deal more responsibility attached to it. You heard an interesting presentation earlier how this one-on-one -on -one can be coped with, but what I'd like to do is give you some examples that shows you how, as a provider, you will find yourself of a real problem in that segment unless you tackle the issue. What this concerns is insurance, click your way through, buy something in here, buy something else there, and so on. B2B customers find the whole thing nuts. Flights where you spend 36 hours in Djibouti, offering that is not really a good idea. Um, Ruptured Media in support, I booked it, somebody else did it, but no, we cannot give you the invoice. That's not good either. So if you want to get to the final customer, who is a B2B customer, then offer what the customer actually wants. We can talk about how business models are emerging on the basis of recognizing frustration that people feel, uh, frustrations that can be sorted by means of digitization. Next, there is this very well-off B2B customer who doesn't want to be distracted and to find end-to-end is not enough, and he's frustrated because he wants a difference. The second um, story I'd like to tell you is something I find quite exciting. It concerns the role of the travel manager. The travel manager, today gatekeeper, purchaser, the guy who registers uh, staff travel activities is somebody, and we've discussed this at length, who is a very challenged person with a very difficult role. Here's a wonderful example, because that is the end-to-end -end travel process. And the different colors you see are the different departments which a travel process goes through, despite all the difficulties and despite all the end-to-end -end encryption surmounting strategies. But these are still all sorts of departments and bottlenecks which have to be gone through. Question. Well, when we prepared that, we discussed the issue, and we were surprised how many questions crop up. I can tell you, in the last 10 years, I've been working in distribution myself, and I've experienced this situation. Say so you've been invited uh, for a presentation. It's hassle-free end-to-end process, and you think you can you know, present, get an award, and maybe uh, even attract a few customers. But in reality, uh, doors open. There are five people sitting there who talked about, who the hell are you? 
Uh, you present yourself and then say, oh, the sixth guy we don't know. And actually, what you have there is the four heads of the department of the company who will do the security, all the invoicing, all the expense accounts. And um, they show you their business cards as head of department A and B and C and D. And if you know me, you know that I uh, dis dislike German bureaucraties. I mean, department is the first term. I mean, it's something which you know from, from a German railway. So what is a, a department like compartment, a tiny place where it's peacefully and quiet? And when you say you, you run a department, it means you're the guardian of a small place which is supposed to be closed in and quiet. And if somebody like you is to introduce an end-to-end -end process, you better just go away. Because those four people have to a lot have to discuss an awful lot before they reach the level of maturity to even understand what end-to-end -end process really means. I'm sure that you've um, been to various events and you see all these hassle-free end-to-end process, quote, unquote. But my question is, do you think companies have got to the way that they can do a hustle-free end-to-end process? Have they got the relevant maturity level? But that challenge is definitely what we'll need in order to shape the day after tomorrow. But if we don't tackle that, um, we've had this um, travel manager motto thing. I mean, any travel manager who doesn't take this hassle-free end-to-end process as a challenge will be a problem. Uh, just somebody we want to pension off early and not the guy we want to have, sh have shape our future. There's another aspect I would like to um, talk, uh, talk into the Microsoft story. Big global companies now come and um, uh, shift all these company premises in, in these uh, sort of um, special belts around the cities and go to the center uh, areas of the city and, and rapidly reduce the space they have so that people can go with public transport to their offices rather than be commuters from somewhere outside of town and, and commute into the city. That is another type of mobility management as we understand it. In other words, the mobility of the workforce needs to be orchestrated now. It's not just to uh, be the travel guy in your company who books people's flights. So travel management is completely different now. And I can add to that because when we started, we said there are opportunities in there. Out there, lots of changes are going to happen. Whether we call them war for talent or digitization or whatever other mega trend you uh, use as a headline, but there are opportunities. And the question is, this sort of process in a company we now have will only really account for the trip that leads to an expense account and all that. But we think from 2018 following on, you, you should look into all other sorts of trips that people take in the country, even if they're not expense account travel, business travel type things. So it's an extreme widening of the area of responsibility and competence. Today we've got some individuals, very innovative travel managers who've been tackling that. I'll take um, the fact that people have been waving at me um, to say I've been running out of time, so let's go and skip some of the things I wanted to tell you and just go focus on what's important. The big thesis is there is a new plurality in a huge market, and I would like to tell you two examples. Just in Germany, 1.2 million business travelers a day, so it's a ginormous market. It's a market that slowly but surely is growing. Um, you, you can get statistics um, from us about this, about the growing business travel markets if you give us your card later. What's also very interesting is the level of expenses every year for a business traveler. Business traveler tends to spend twice the amount that any other traveler does, so the market is very interesting. And that market is sort of uh, like an oligop ol ol oligopoly. It's a huge elephantine market. Oh, it has these um, structures the multi-centered structures in which it is in, in prison. And um, there is a lot of risk capital in this. And that is the very travel market that we're interested in. And what you see is here the various layers that we have as these oligopolic structures. Every single layer nicely structures, and you can see huge markets, very little movement. And as you pointed out, there is a, a merger which hasn't yet happened between mobility and, and uh, motive or uh, automotive. The problem is really that the business trips 
tend to be top to bottom, bottom to top, but they happen in, in perpendicular mode to the services, and that's where the digital hackers can get into it. There are more than 1,000 travel tech startups that were set up with uh, venture capital worth 10 billion. And I would like to tell you, for the time being, they're very much focusing on the B2C sector. But we will see that B2C, um, yeah, we'll have some big investments, yes. Are we talking about this as if it doesn't matter? But we are right at the heart of Germany. And that's the penultimate slide which you show with the two circles. Let's put, at, um, put our attention at where Germany is. On the right-hand side, global funding trends. Now, so that tells you the countries where in some labs or accelerators or whatever you want to call it, in Newspeak, in television you call it the lion's den, that's where they go. They're saying, you know, we've got a proper structure process. And at the end, they, they sit in front of some CEO and say, I've got to get funding released to the tune of XYZ, and I've got this idea. It could be my taxi, or 10 years ago, it could have been Airbnb. And then they get a top-down agreement or not, and then once they have approval, they can implement their idea. When you see how many countries follow that sort of process, and I can tell you, 3%, Germany ended in that uh, section. Uh, looking at the HRS presentation two days ago with Mr. Fischer, the former uh, vice chancellor in Germany, Joschka Fischer, said the world uh, is going to wake up and, and the world will happen between the Chinese wall and uh, Silicon Valley and anything in between is going to watch in amazement. Just imagine what Engelbert is showing you on the slide here. Every single day in these accelerators and labs, whether it's Lufthansa Innovation App or the 18... Uh, 86 at Daimler, every one of these companies has some sort of lab where people who are young at heart, it's got nothing to do with, with age, literal age, go to brainstorm ideas. They want to do something like my taxi. They want to do away with receipts or things like that. There are lots of examples of that type. But just look whether you find any German companies there. I can see one there. Oh, boy, yeah, that's a colleague um, from Hamburg. But I mean, it tends to be very much dominated by either Asian or American markets. Can I ask a question? How do you explain this? Why is it that in Germany things go so much more slowly? I mean, we're not lazy or do no investments or don't engage in research. If you look at the budget, uh, it's not less. No, the budgets are, are a great deal less. I mean, by a factor of 30, that's the, the money spent on venture capital in, in Germany. If you um, leave your your young into um, the office world, and you can say somebody gets to be join the civil service. He's arrived. If it's uh, somebody else, an entrepreneur, yeah. But uh, you know, um, in the middle of, of his or her career, somebody has to do something else and change. That's considered to be failure in Germany, whereas in in the U.S., for example, it would be seen as a very positive sign. So there are lots and lots of aspects like that which should be mentioned. And the huge amount of capital, even here in Germany, exists that is looking for ideas. Here in Berlin, Frankfurt, Munich, there are masses of scouting companies where you can go to to make your pitch. I can t only tell you about my own experience in Berlin where I have been um, providing support for startups. I can tell you there is a huge influx of people from Estonia, from Sweden, Portugal, and these are countries that are sort of hungry for all these new ideas, and they provide more innovation-hungry people than we have here in this country. On the other hand, there are opportunities because there is sufficient capital available. I am trying to answer your question. In our project team, we also had a young guy who just sold his company, right? And he told us that uh, he sees a, a problem for Germany in this whole process. You've got an idea, now you want to sell it. Either you want to you go into the B2C market, then you've got to have huge amounts of uh, search engines, SEOs, um, search engine optimization money. That's what you need to spend so as to, to appear in the, the um, Google sites that are non-paid for um, advertising. Or you sell it to, to other people, competent environment. And then, of course, the deciding process in German companies, this funding takes so long that by the time they come to a decision, they've run out of money. That's a bitter moment. You've got a, pro a product which you really want to launch in the market. You look for a friendly user, in other words, a company that's uh, happy to try it. By the time that company decides to go ahead, spend so long until there's no money, money left and the idea will go and die. 
Well, we'll hear more about that um, and discuss it, especially with Airbnb. The most important thing is to just go ahead and do. Technology, it's a third um, pillar, if you like, um, which means that we're going to have a huge wave of disruption. Just blockchain or chat box are the buzzwords in this context. So we are saying a great deal about um, AI, cloud architecture. In Frankfurt, for example, they've started a huge multi-cloud project where we can connect data across clouds. So there is a demand side, which is almost screaming for new innovation at the moment. But there's a supply side also, where masses of capital tries to reformat the market. And then we have technology, lots that would help us to change things. I mean, the whole blockchain issue, for example. But we also have the issue of data data connections, where for the time being, we have some quite odd conflicts of people who keep sitting on their data. And they need to understand that data aren't sort of items and boring, but could actually be turned into something quite exciting, exhilarating. And uh, we need to get into the data, and, and through using the data, we can create added value. So I'm sorry, I've spent a couple more minutes than we had agreed on. I'm now looking forward to what you have to say. Regarding your last slide, let me add something. I think in the last three months, I've been at some of the panel discussions. And looking back, I mean, as I say, I had the luxury to be invited to take part in several ones, always on the left or the right in the banner. It always had the words simplicity or customer-centered or something. And I ask myself, if you read simplicity five times and customer centricity five times, and you're a travel manager, then you have to deal with at least five companies, all of which are keen to sell you simplicity. It's not all that simple. If somebody talks about direct connect in the airline sector, and then you have the hotels. There are online travel agencies who don't need the intermediary anymore. Five times simpler. That's quite complex, actually. So one of the messages we'll have to get you to take home is before we get to what the end and to end process seems to give us in a way of a simple horizon, uh, can only be reached once we've um, surmounted several hurdles on the way. Now, we've heard a lot of talking, but we already said we don't want to just talk. And you see this logo here? And it says, digital attacker at the gates, anti-porters. And when we met, the word digital attacker wasn't all that funny for you, was it? No, it's always something which has a slightly negative connotation, you know, attacker. Well, and uh, at the gates, that is also something where you could start um, um, jokes because there was a German comedian who made a film um, about somebody who was at the gate. So maybe in Germany they would laugh about it. But your company has now been around for 10 years. I think Airbnb, well, you used to be one of the innovative companies. Well, anti-porters is the buzzword at the gates. There were lots of things I wanted to take a note of, uh, I wanted to address. I'll start with anti-porters and the rest. Please feed me my cues. If we look at where we come from, I mean, a few years ago, we did an analysis and found that at Airbnb, all together, 10% of all jobs are business related, all trips are business related. So the trips are primarily business. Even before we really started and got off the ground, we got a bit further than at the gates. We were, we had, you know, a foot in the door, if you like. The next step for us is to say, we'll talk to the companies, we'll try to understand how and what we need to do, how we need to adapt our product so that companies take us into their travel policy as one option. Because both you and companies seem to understand that um, Staff members, depending on, on the situation and the scenario, consider Airbnb quite a, an acceptable or, or even a good alternative. I say an alternative very much on purpose because I believe, let's be honest, what's your ordinary business trip like? Let's say I go in the morning, 6 a.m. flight to Munich, got to appointments all day, have a bite to eat in the evening, maybe go to a bar, bar for a nightcap and then go to my hotel. And that's how it always is, has been and will be, and there's a good reason for that. But there are other scenarios where it would make sense to consider, I mean, especially if you have a longer stay somewhere, relocations or the issue you mentioned 
working itself is changing. People are much more mobile or more project-oriented. You spend a few months here, three months there, and so on. So to have a home away from home seems to be quite an interesting uh, alternative option. And we understand from companies on the basis of the feedback, we receive what we have to do. Certainly, we were a bit surprised at some of them because 95% of the company or 90% of the, of the uh, corporation tend to uh, you know, go for the traveler saying, we do it all for you, complete focus is always going to be the traveler. Now, we try to get feedback from the companies because obviously they have a justified interest in knowing where their people are, how they're accommodated. If you um, have four or five million for accommodation, including tree houses and yurts, then it's not really um, my sort of market. You could say, how can we adapt? How can we offer our product and customize it? So it's an interesting option for that particular company. I think we are on the right track when it comes to doing that. And I noticed that we have some companies where we're dealing uh, with uh, members of 250,000 companies. So that's not just 10, but 15% business trip. While, of course, Airbnb is, is, is growing very steeply, we've got a pre-launch share of business travelers now. And if you follow this, I mean, we've uh, sort of cleaned up uh, the shop a bit. We've introduced new categories. We no longer offer you three categories of accommodation. We have, I think it's altogether seven now, and th that includes bed and breakfast, boutique hotels. All these are issues that, uh, because of the feedback which we got from companies, have been included to where they are now. We even highlight them a bit, and it, it's working quite well. We have a work collection, if you like. We've defined standards where we know that there are certain things which really matter to a business traveler. It has to have Wi-Fi, it has to work well there. Then the cancellation policy needs to be more flexible. Uh, it has to have smoke um, detectors. And it has to have all sorts of things which uh, somebody needs when on a business trip. So we've put all this together in, in a new collection. And um, that means we allow the business traveler to have another way of getting into our platform. It's different uh, from the guy who travels for private purposes. I'd like to go back to the first sentence you said, because otherwise I would have asked you, what was your strategy in the business travel market, and what's your current percentage of business travelers? And if I understand what you said uh, originally, you sort of stumble into that rather than plan to go in, right? In advance of the meeting, we talked about it a bit, and you were surprised that the email addresses of the people who, who are in your database um, are all company emails. You, you were struck by that, and you said, oh, they're not private travelers. I mean, it's not GMX, Google, Yahoo, email, or whatever, but they are well-known company names. And I think that there is something between what Engelbert said and between what you said, and I'm sure there are going to be several traveler managers who are going to wake up to that if they see that the once the end to end process is uh, there, they know what to book, which which partners they want to book with, and when it comes to the invoicing, they get the emails as to where exactly people have booked, and most of them will find, and that's what I would like to ask you to comment, uh, that they see um, a lot of the hotels are not booked uh, according to the channel that they would like to see, and then you go through your books and you will notice, ah, they ended up with me. Without anybody actually seeking this out, without having a policy in place, and Given that, you have to ask yourself the question, if you look at this, uh, of the aims, simplicity and customer centricity, is that something must have happened there. Are you so attractive that uh, without actually being asked, uh, people uh, kind of automatically uh, uh, gravitate towards you? Well, you spoke about customer centricity. Customer centricity is also a bit absurd as a category because, of course, I know that uh, the uh, um, employees will uh, uh, look us up, and if we uh, can present an offer to the corporate world without destroying the benefits of Airbnb, without having to uh, include a specific uh, window in the TMC, then I think uh, it works. Customer centricity, I do understand that we have quite a number of customers that uh, stick with us, many business travelers that uh, 
use our offers. And uh, the question is really uh, to what extent that customer centricity is really uh, something that uh, is uh, alien to the business, really. Well, at some point in time, we came to think about our workplace as uh, the place where we had our computers and machinery stood, uh, where we put down our laptop. And nowadays, we have the uh, cell phone in our pocket, and we're well on the way to a new work environment. And it becomes very, very difficult to define the actual workspace. There are attempts to regulate it or to create some constraints in order to get a hold on it. but. We're actually living, uh, and it, we're actually embarked on a journey to a new work future, and uh, it's become much less clear whether a supplier uh, with whom I work is perhaps close, more closer involved uh, with my particular work environment than uh, the immediate uh, department uh, next to mine. And, uh, those, and you start getting together and working in, 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 in separate workspaces. And organizing that is, uh, uh, is actually ideal for the kind of offer that you make. And this uh, really is this kind of a top-down thing that were, if I were a venture capitalist, uh, I would invest in that kind of uh, business model. And instead of uh, simply investing in uh, process optimization. Well, you can see that uh, we're sitting on stage here, um, illuminated by projectors. doesn't allow us to see you well, but how was it actually? Uh, was it that travel manager then in a company uh, then contacted you and said, well, we need the uh, smoke detector and we need the emergency exits in order to book this and uh, also uh, uh, lighting on the floor uh, in case of emergency, then I would include you in uh, my program. But what was your first encounter? How uh, did it come about? Uh, how did you get in touch with the travel management uh, scene, as it were? Well, it was uh, quite an experience. It was really quite extreme because um, I don't hail from the business travel segment and um, I hadn't had that much experience in the travel industry, and I had to s write down vocabulary. I had to try and understand the language spoken, uh, the abbreviations, what, uh, who uh, will receive money from whom, what kind of bookings take place. And I had to look at this uh, uh, extremely intricate and maze of connections there. And then I understood that uh, this, uh, these this very different approach is also linked to a kind of fear of uh, who we are in a way. And, that, and the first feedback that I received from travel managers uh, in various debates was uh, quite reluctant. And I said to myself, well, this will, is going to be a long journey. And um, of course, we've already uh, been underway for a while. We have quite a lot of travelers that are enthusiastic about us. but. It's also uh, important and the right thing to do to uh, make sure to, to see that companies have certain uh, demands or certain uh, preconditions, and you need to meet them. But, uh, but of course, going through scenarios like what happens if this happens, what follows if that happens, uh, people are very, very skeptical in uh, Germany. I, contacted my colleagues in England, in the UK, in France, and asked them how things were going on their, side, their, their neck of the woods, because I had to say it was really tough on my side. Well, um, yeah, I started working for uh, uh, an American uh, digital company, and, uh, and we had these kind of callbacks where people said, well, asked, well, how about the margins? And then people were, and we always had to say, well, no, we still have to go through this step and that step. And of course, that's no fun. And we're talking about digital opportunities and we're talking about laboratories here. And then you realize that you're talking with people who have a completely different language. And do you have the imp impression that they're uh, trying to uh, keep you out uh, as long as possible, actually, that they're very reluctant in that sense? Well, everybody knows Airbnb. It's uh, part of a very controversial debate going on. Uh, shared economy is a buzzword. The, I think the interest is there. I think where we have improved is to 
to better ascertain whether it's a one-off interest or whether this is an ongoing conversation uh, given that, and given that I have a certain responsibility as the area manager for the Dach region, I cannot engage simply in lengthy debates that don't lead anywhere. So things have changed. Things have developed. We have developed. We did our, have done our homework. Uh, and the companies are more open-minded and our interlocutors are more open-minded. They have progressed as well. And I think we've... Uh, started a flow there, a back and forth, where we can start uh, really defining objectives and common objectives and where we can uh, start uh, exploring uh, whether Airbnb is uh, an opportunity or what can we do about these uh, problems that still seem to exist or stumbling blocks that exist uh, proactively. And then uh, we need to provide solutions and uh, answers also uh, to topics that are uh, perhaps uh, fraught as well, but it's a bit of a lengthy answer here, but I do believe that the perception and uh, the way Airbnb is uh, perceived uh, is changing. It's growing in the market, and there's more and more acceptance in the market for us. If you look at uh, reports such as Statista, and, or if you look at objective uh, information sources, uh, or others, then uh, it becomes obvious you don't own a hotel, you don't own a single uh, apartment. Uh, Thirty, you're more like 30 billion market capitalization. You're more like Marriott hotels in that category and others. Obviously, uh, you won't only encounter uh, friendly attitudes in the business world. So the question is, are people coming to Germany using Airbnb, and how? What is the percentage of business travel that uh, seeks out your office in? the market here. Well, I can't give you these uh, figures because I don't actually have them here. But uh, the German market, of course, there are differences between markets, but the, the German market in terms of inbound and outbound travelers and their behavior is uh, not uh, is, is, is not more reluctant than the French or English market. Uh, I mean, it is the case that uh, there's a certain goodwill and a certain uh, open-mindedness vis-a-vis uh, -vis new things there. Well, I think uh, your last answer does uh, induce me to believe that uh, the uh, changes that you have had to f affect due to business travel uh, might lead to the question as, as to whether you have retained your old uh, DNA as Airbnb, if you will. We might debate this in the last next couple of minutes. We have three or four minutes left. Uh, there's a roving mic here, so perhaps this might go out to the public because uh, uh, our theory is mature or die. So uh, digitalization or digitization is zero one, to be or not to be. So what we're explaining here, laying out before you, is not just uh, a fun topic, but that uh, this uh, mobility, digital mobility, is uh, global. And uh, we have uh, unicorns, i.e. a billion dollar capitalized uh, startups. And uh, these are people that are uh, moving into the sphere that have no background in travel at all. You have <coughs> Google, Amazon, for example. Mr. Uh, Schultz will be giving us a presentation on how you can uh, uh, order your car with the help of Alexa. Uh, so these are already um, offers and uh, initiatives that exist in the market. So some of you, you will probably have embraced this enthusiastically. Others are perhaps uh, moving into different areas as a consequence of this and might not find this uh, as uh, likable as others might. So uh, you have the opportunity now to voice your uh, feelings. I think this is really very interesting because this is a question that we uh, explore with our customers as well, because in Germany, uh, the attempt is always to try to embed in an end-to-end -end process, and then suddenly you have these disruptive uh, uh, players who are trying to offer uh, an alternative. So perhaps you could uh, flesh it out a bit. <coughs> if you meet a travel manager or somebody who is a decision maker in a company, and uh, they tell you, we want to book our travels uh, via Airbnb, but uh, actually I want to keep it within an end-to-end -end process. Are there any uh, thoughts being uh, uh,
thoughts as to how you can do this, or is that something that you wouldn't do at all? I think um, our experience shows us that it should be black or white. Yes, we do it, or no, we won't. But reality is uh, well, we have a bit of a blinkered view, and we do know that this happens. But as long as I don't say anything, I don't have to assume any responsibility for it. And uh, I find that difficult to understand, really. We have a product. Let's uh, leave the traveler uh, outside of this and or say that, well, they decide for it. And then we know that uh, this uh, uh, benchmark that we've built for the traveler, where we can actually subsume all of the uh, bookings for the company there, we can uh, uh, send the data to the duty of care provider, ISOS, and to the relevant teams, we can uh, improve the situation. But at the same time, we cannot uh, fix uh, a green exit, uh, a green exit uh, sign over the uh, entrances of all of the four, four and a half million uh, uh, objects that we have there in our uh, list. Just imagine you're in a, in a company and then you hear, uh, you get feedback, uh, people are unhappy, but you've been listening for this, or you've been listening to this for 10 years, and then suddenly comes, somebody comes in and says, let's, let's see, you know, they can, they can, uh, they can, they have a proposal, and they will tell you that uh, on average, uh, an overnight stay in Germany is 64 euro, and customer satisfaction is over 90 percent. There's nobody who uh, complained about a missing fire extinguisher or a wardrobe that toppled over. Okay, right, and right hand door opens, travel manager comes in. After six months of uh, negotiation with uh, hotels, it's not uh, easy, and we agreed to a corporate uh, rate of 95 euros. And and the next round is all just around the corner, but everything's working very well, end to end, perfect. Now, my answer would be, as a CFO, how would you decide? Would you go take the left hand door or the right hand door? And if you ask travelers, they say, and you ask them whether they're uh, satisfied, and as he said, he has yurts, he has uh, tree houses and uh, boats on rivers, etc. So these are very attractive, uh, fashionable uh, destinations or, or offers as well. And if you uh, but if you call a hotel, for example, you, you have a reception, you hear the reception is perhaps and the accent uh, reveals whether you're in Paris or in London, but hotels really look alike. And uh, in this case, this is a complete turnaround. And we're not talking about, uh, uh, about the, the final customer here. We're talking about to you as a, as a market participant here. And if the CFO tells you this story, then uh, actually, the, the, the business case for such a hotel uh, rate is becoming uh, uh, more and more tenuous. And I think at the end of the day, this uh, will probably not be very positive. So uh, I think we probably have to spell it out as it is. Uh, for 10 years, you've been complaining, a CFO who never wants to, uh, who doesn't want to have to deal with travel, he will probably choose a left hand door at some point in time. Well, exactly. Those people who try to think uh, beyond uh, existing constraints, try to think outside of the box. Why not uh, offer Airbnb? Where's the risk in it? If you get up tomorrow morning and uh, then uh, you look into the mirror and you ask yourself, I'll try it, and then, you know, come up with 10, 15 different ideas. And the, the, the worst case scenario would be that you could actually make a lot of money on the back of this. Well, an Airbnb certified house, you have to, uh, you have to write into the lower right-hand side of a mirror. Uh, the object that you see here might be bigger than you think. That's always in the rear uh, mirrors of uh, American cars. Well, talking to those large uh, DMCs, business, uh, Amex, etc. And then, uh, and BV is actually an insurance company in the Netherlands. And uh, um, next to the Cayman Islands, there are uh, 
tax haven in uh, the Netherlands, and the Netherlands are the greatest tax haven in Europe. And uh, perhaps, in a way, Airbnb can uh, already uh, offer a, a tax improved uh, uh, package in that sense. Perhaps you have to uh, be uh, go about it in a free and frank way and say. Uh, Things can't just go on along the same lines. Things have to change. Further questions, please? Roving Mike is on its way. That's very, very interesting to uh, we're really talking about founding new uh, opportunities here. Well, courage, pride, and uh, persistence. I think those are things that uh, hold you back and uh, getting started, starting something new. Up. And there's also war for talents out there. And there are quite a few opportunities, different opportunities. So why suffer three years, for example, and courage? Why try it out? Because of course you can fail. And pride means do I dare go to the people who have the money, offer up my idea. If I don't offer it up, I won't make it. But it is this idea that is linked to a kind of pride and sense of pride. And I do think that that uh, holds many people back. And if you say that um, people from Spain come here, think uh, they probably are uh, don't have as many opportunities in Spain as we have in Germany, perhaps, as young people. And perhaps that's uh, one of the reasons why more ideas uh, are emerging from Spain in that sense. So that's the question. Courage, pride, and persistence. What does that mean as a, for you as a digital attacker in that sense? Well, I can only speak uh, about my area. Uh, we have Airbnb for work, and that's a, a small part of the overall structure of Airbnb. Pride courage and persistence. Well, you need all of that. Uh, youth, dementia as well. <laughs> all of that is very useful. No, I believe that we need uh, resilience in that sense and uh, persistence in order to explain to the market what we do. Uh, we can add uh, things, report, uh, prepare data, make data available. It's a long path, and those are justified questions that we're confronted with. So I do believe that certain persistence is very, very important, and uh, courage. If this uh, business model that seems to be working very well, do you also have ideas about offering additional items, such as uh, meeting rooms or shared offices? <coughs> Well, there are quite a few things that would make sense if we could offer them to the travelers. I mean, I think uh, the overnight says is something that we have a, a good uh, handle on. I think you can also add quite a lot of other as items. Uh, we also have a topic which is the loyalty program that we're looking at, whether that makes sense. We have a cooperation with WeWork, so that's business traveler. traveler and if you're identified as a business traveler, then you can, in certain markets, uh, or if you book via Airbnb, then you uh, can also uh, uh, book a conference room or a, or a desk in a WeWork space. And that's what Engelbert just um, touched upon when he uh, uh, spoke about the new uh, work environments when you travel to a certain place, not just to um, spend a night there or stay for a night, but um, you also want to work there. Well, we have to come to the end, but I would like to uh, quote as an answer. J Jeff Bezos has uh, a writing above his door which says, it's still day one, meaning we're still at the very beginning of the opportunities. Or, unfolding as yet. And then it's not just about being courageous, but you need to simply hold out your hand and grasp the opportunity. And the third point is 
if once your life draws to an end and look back, then uh, you will perhaps regret having done certain things or have not having done certain things. And then it's much easier to uh, get started. If you have an idea, don't wait. OK, zero minutes left. We've reached the end of the line. Thank you very much. A round of applause, please, for the panelists.